I think we did it. Are we live? Hello? I think we're live. We're live. I think we did it. Hi. Hello. Hello. Welcome to one of our episodes of Spilling the Tea. I'm Shelby Knieffel. I'm Charles McGarvey. And this is our wonderful guest, Maha Kamal. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me. So we had a little bit of a slow start. We had some technical difficulty. So I know you're all at home waiting and uh, sorry about that. Timing. How many millennials does it take to How many millennials watch does it people take? Like, I don't know. But the lighting is fantastic. Which I'm technically not a millennial, so I okay. have the excuse that I don't even know how this technology works. <laughs> well, like. I would, I guess that falls on me this time then. I still use an abacus. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure you do. On your phone, because it's right. Yeah, yeah, right. an app on your phone. That sounds very hipster. I bet that does exist. I bet Absolutely. it does exist, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, Maha, mm -hmm. we're really excited to have you, so thank you. Um, and we kind of just want to chat a little bit and see what's up with you, different things going on. Sure. So I guess we could start with um, the legal profession and how you got how you got your ESQ dot. Um, and you're yes, doing dot. Yes, I updated my Instagram with that when I got <laughs> it. Um, I just passed, what is it, my fifth anniversary? Yeah, it was last wow. Sunday. I know, I know, and you're just like, oh my god. Five years. Um, I know, yeah. <laughs> just like that. Um, so, let's see, I did my undergrad at CU Boulder in International Affairs. And then I took some time off um, and did a whole bunch of nonprofit stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and also web content development so it's weird I've always loved to build websites and do graphic design and so that's nice. why I kind of still do that mm -hmm. um, which is why my current firm website is driving me crazy because it's not coded the way that I want it to yeah. I just don't have time for it. Um, so I took some time off and I was actually thinking about doing something pre-med um, and I really oh. wanted to get into genetic counseling I got into nursing at NYU um, and then I'm like I can't even see my own blood yeah. <laughs> Um, and somebody, I guess there's a whole bunch of friends that said, hey, why don't you, you know, consider applying for law school, at least, you know, study for the LSAT, so I started to do that, um, and then, yeah, I got admitted to DU and started there in 2010, which is, oh my god, almost 10 years ago, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. That's an awesome journey, though, I mean, yeah. international affairs, medicine, and law, I don't know, that's a lot of well, and web this is design. What, I know, <laughs> I know. A little artistic bow and right. cherry right on top. The reason why, and people ask me this too, because my undergrad is in from CU, and then I kind of have to split my patriotism and like <laughs> royalty between CU and DU, I feel like. Um, DU has a great international law program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure CU has something um, similar now, um, but back then, um, they had a fantastic international law program, and I really wanted to do something in international law. Um, and I actually ended up doing that my last year of law school. So I did go to the Hague, Netherlands, and work oh, wow. at the uh, Lebanon Tribunal. Yeah, that was really Whoa. awesome. It was super surreal. Yeah. Wow. How long were you there? Um, six months. Okay. So it was my last semester of law school. So you um, were in the Hague for a full six months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, worked at the office of the prosecutor and got to do all of their. I did a lot of their um, research. For um, it's a really interesting uh, topic on third-party um, privacy rights and telecommunications. Okay. Um, yeah, the the tribunal actually is prosecuting um, top officials uh, from Hezbollah, um, not Hezbollah as an organization, but they all just so happen to be part of Hezbollah. But okay. Rafiq Hariri was there, um, the Lebanon's former prime minister, and he was um, assassinated in a pretty gnarly bombing in, in central beirut in 2005 on valentine's day oh okay. and so through a series of all these complicated things that happened at the international level um they created this um, tribunal and so yeah we got to work with them and wow yeah, it was awesome. <clears throat> how did you make it from international affairs and international law to family law mm -hmm. which is what you practice now oh right? my gosh i know this is um <laughs> this is kind of nuts um so i actually did the student uh, law clinic and at DU my second year. So I think I feel like the only time I was actually in classes, physically in classes in law school was my first year. And then second year I lived in the student law office at DU. 
Um, but I did the civil rights clinic, and we actually went to federal trial on a solitary confinement case, um, and which went on to become a class action lawsuit and oh, wow. fundamentally changed everything at CDOC when it comes to solitary confinement. So that was really cool. Um, but after the federal trial was over, like I had nothing to do that summer. You know, I had planned about you know to do anything, and so I ended up in career services. Um, and they said, hey, why don't you take a break and try something new, like family law? Um, and there was a law firm that was hiring at the time. Um, and then when I came back from Europe, I kind of had a similar issue where, you know, what am I gonna do? I've been out of the country for a year at that point because I spent time um, in London as well. And so by the time I got back, I had to study for the bar, I kind of needed a supplemental income. So I went back to that same law firm. Um, and then just so happens, kept going to family law. <laughs> Do you yeah. see yourself staying in family law? Probably not. No? Um, okay. I don't want to lose it, and I don't want to say anything too poorly about it. It's an incredibly challenging um, area of law. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to expand it out a little bit, um, probably either do something federal. So federal government really doesn't work with family law that much, um, except for the Hague Abduction Treaty. Um, and so if, you're if, you know, if a parent abducts a child and leaves the United States and vice versa, comes okay. to the United States, um, anything to do with the State Department ends up getting kicked over to the federal courts. And that would be kind of a really interesting, um, I think, intersection yeah. between family law yeah. and international law. Um, but I think what I was planning on when I was at the, the, the Lebanon Tribunal, um, I spoke to some of the, the prosecutors there. So the chief prosecutor, and I also know the chief prosecutor of the International Court, mm -hmm. Criminal Court, Separate Court. And they both advised me that you have to go back to your home jurisdiction and get your trial experience there. So they don't train lawyers okay. at the international level. So I'm about hitting that mark. So three to five years is what they said. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to get back into international law, this would be the time to um, consider that. But um, yeah, I, I don't want to lose everything in family law. I just don't see myself. Right. Mm -hmm. To blend more Retiring ways. in it? Yeah. It must also be so yeah. emotionally, you must be so emotionally attached to a lot of your cases, you know, I mean, when, when it's, yeah. when it's uh, government entities and, you know, complex international politics and policies, like, that's one thing, but when it's a person and children, like, right sure. in front of you, that yeah. must be, that must tug on the heartstrings. Mm -hmm. It, that's a good way of putting it, um, absolutely it does, and it's not a practice rate for everybody. Right. Um, I think it requires extreme self-care, probably more so than other practice areas. Um, I mean, I openly tell my clients and colleagues, I, I have a therapist, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's yeah, almost... Too. Everyone I know, should. Yeah. <laughs> and they really should, um, because... Shameless therapist. Right. Right. No, I, love, I love her if she's watching. No, she's not. Um, <laughs> but that's one way that I kind of help maintain like boundaries, and it's good sure. for the client as well, because you don't want to get too intertwined right. with their lives, mm -hmm. um, but it's such a intimate area of law that it's hard not for that to happen. So there are a lot of times when I am playing therapist, um, but I am pretty good and I'm trying to be good about um, keeping that boundary and saying, hey, here's a list of um, some therapists I would recommend that would mm -hmm. probably help you get through this. Um, so I do have that comprehensive list too, but it is, yeah. And I feel like, um but nowadays, we, we talk about work-life balance, and mm -hmm. it tends to fall into more, at least in my opinion, a little bit more of this like buzzword that we always hear. We talk about work-life balance, work-life balance, sure. and all they go and do this. So, to you, what do you, what would you describe as work-life balance, and what are what are some of your other super awesome things that you want to <laughs> share that you do in order to help balance it and pull back your life aside from just being Mahakmal attorney. Yeah, yes, Q. Yes, um, <laughs> I like it. I know, I like it. Um, I, I think family law really pushed me into thinking about prioritizing self-care. Mm -hmm. and, and what really got me started was about, I want to say 2017. I had been working at that point for about, I want to say three years, um, two years as an attorney and one year as um, a paralegal slash law clerk, I guess, when I was waiting on my results. Um, in family law and I I hadn't taken a vacation and I just kept going and then in 2017 after about six months of having my own law firm I thought what am I doing like I, I did international law I did international <coughs> affairs before that um, I haven't seen the world and I don't mm -hmm. know what happened but I got this travel bug that clearly has not uh, stopped you know yeah. <laughs> um, 
But I started prioritizing that. So I thought, okay, if I could go anywhere in the world, where would I want to go? And then I, I was thinking about it, and I thought, oh my god, where would I go? Mm -hmm. And so I started with something safe. What was this? This is 2017. Okay. okay. Um, I thought, well, I've never been to San Francisco. Oh. So I started kind of slow, and then May 2017, I took a solo trip to San Francisco and had a lot of fun. It's a great city. Um, and what I'd like to do when I travel is um, look up meetup.com, Facebook events, um, and go immerse myself with the locals. And so I ended up doing like a, a comic book workshop there what? at like, a <laughs> random bookstore in San Francisco. That's um, awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. I just like to do stuff that's like way out there. And mm -hmm. then I love that. And then that same year I did Costa Rica. Um, I think I did it. No, did I do it twice? No, I did Costa Rica once. And then I went to Europe and then Mexico City. And then it just kept going into 2018, and then yes. it just kept going into 2019. I just got back from Mexico City. Oh, I love Mexico City. I've never been before, and I actually wrote a piece about it for the docket. That's oh, cool. On the next issue, but I, I was so, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but it was, I was blown away. Yeah. It was, it's such Mexico a City. cosmopolitan, awesome. artistic, yes. cool city. I actually did meetups there too, so language exchange, because I, I, my Spanish is kind of rusty after yeah. undergrad, um, and so this was a great way to just launch into it, and a couple of us were kind of like the orphans on Christmas Eve, just walking around Zocalo, like all of Mexico City, and I was, I felt like I was in a movie, <laughs> I really cool. did, it was really fun, so I've, I've stayed in touch with a lot of the friends that I meet along the way, but, um, that has really been a priority for me in terms of, um, I, I, I don't, work-life balance, apparently people don't like that term. I don't yeah. know how else to put it. Mm -hmm. um, Do some things besides working. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Uh. I think the counter <laughs> argument I've heard is that it should, you know, you should love work and it shouldn't be separate from your life or something. And I think... I, would kind I think of you have disagree. to have a really good job yeah. for that yeah. to be the case. Yeah. Like, I think it also just kind of overshadows that every job, similar to family law, like you love it, but there are different frustrations or different sure. kind of things, and to completely sure. ignore that, I think would be, you know, not, not else, you're, you're tipping the scale too far. Right, right. and you balance. can't pursue all of your passions as a job, you know what I mean? Totally. So, you know, I'd love to be a, I wanted to be a photojournalist for National Geographic, I'm mm -hmm. I can't do that, and do law, and do all these other things, mm -hmm. so I've kind of carved out weird ways to do what I want to do and still practice law, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, I do agree that you need to just do it, and I've had colleagues ask me, like, how do you travel so much, and I said, pick a couple places, look at long term, like two to three months or down the line, look at gaps in your calendar and just book it. Mm -hmm. Once you book it, you're gonna make, it. what's crazy is you start working around it. How many yeah. trips do you think you go on a year, typically? Um, anywhere between three to four. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so this year, I started uh, over Christmas, and this is funny, I always tell people this, I schedule my trips based off parenting plans. <laughs> so the likelihood of like holidays coming up are probably the, the best time to book because it'll be less busy in the office. So summertime's a great time to do it. Uh, spring break is pretty mm -hmm. quiet. People are not calling and you know have, have issues come up. Um, Christmas is a good time to go. Mm -hmm. Um, mid to end of November, like this month is a good time to go, so I've kind of figured it out. Nice. Um, what also is a, a, a big thing, and I think that I would encourage attorneys to try to find colleagues that have like-minded interests. Um, there are a few of us that all love to travel, mm -hmm. that are all family lawyers, and so I'll agree, okay, if we go to China for two months, or, or not two months, that's too long, two weeks, <laughs> like, I'd love to do that. Yeah. It's two weeks, then you'll cover me when I'm in Mexico City and, right. and Costa Rica or something. Cool. So that really helps out a lot, too, with <coughs> making sure that, yeah, mm -hmm. that your clients are always taken care of. Um, but this year, let's see, I went to Japan over Christmas and New Year's last year. Where did you go in Japan? Um, Tokyo and Kyoto. Cool. Um, Kyoto is one of my favorite places in the whole. I mean, it's Japan such is a one of my cool favorite places. Tokyo is on my list of places. Like, I, I mean, I can't life. explain it. France, right? That's what I've been France ain't got nothing on the food in Japan. It's oh my the god, best food in the whole world. Yeah. Like, everything from like the 
pastries to it's like, like amazing. It's, just, it's surreal. And it's so mm -hmm. clean. The people are so nice. I fell in love with the vending machines. Oh, that what? They, the they the hot beverage? Hot, yeah. hot, hot, hot cans of coffee. Like oh, okay. coffee. Yeah. You'll be in the subway and you can just get a hot I was so jazzed tea. on caffeine the whole time I was there because I'd be like, oh, look, around, there's yeah. another one. I, I got to stop. Did you go to the 7-Eleven in Tokyo? The 7 I couldn't get out of the 7-Eleven. It's, so it's like... It's, it's so, so much different than 7-Eleven here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get like cocktails in a can, you can get it's like... Crazy. And did they sing to you when you came into the store? Yes. It's very yeah. weird, but everybody wow. sings in unison when you go when into When you come stores. into a store, and also like when you leave a store, yeah. I can't remember what the term what it is, is you know? what they yeah. say, but like... Yeah, and it keeps happening. So 7-Eleven's <laughs> busy, and it just, yeah. they keep doing they it, keep but doing they're just it. stalking, and they just keep saying it. It's It's... But so, but the, like those types of experiences when you're in Tokyo or you're in like whatever you're doing and you're really happy about it, I think that that encourages you and resets you for work. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, to I say, agree. okay, not only am I helping my clients, not only am I enjoying the work, and you know, uh, you know, in my case, presenting to the courts and, and doing that kind of stuff, but I also get to benefit, you know, and enjoy mm -hmm. the fruits of that labor by having these cool experiences in, mm -hmm. in different countries. Uh, and it, you know, travel may not be for everybody. I don't want to push that on anybody, but that's mm -hmm. definitely something that's always been a big deal to me. So, so well, segueing mm -hmm. from that, um, Maha here for the Docket Arts and Literature Contest <laughs> of 2018. Um, one, not one, but two categories. She was the winner for two of the categories for the, um, the contest. And did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Right. So um, what'd you win? What'd you do? So the first one, that was the bear, I think, the logo on the bear. Um, mm -hmm. I use, uh, this is crazy, because people say, what do you use for art? Um, and I have two, there's the traditional and digital. So for digital, I actually use the iPad um, okay. and Procreate. Um, and the, the Apple Pencil is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, it's funny, um, I feel like Adobe is probably sweating bullets a little bit. Because <laughs> the Apple's kind of definitely um, catching up in many ways. Um, but I don't know, I was, I was just doodling. Um, <clears throat> I'm working, I was, I think at that time, working on a children's book. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, and I was like, well, what would the illustrations look like? And that's when I came up with this idea of this little girl that goes on an adventure with her bear through this, like, imaginary world. And um, it's a, it's kind of a rough sketch. Mm -hmm. um, but I submitted that. And then the poem was interesting because I'm, this is, I think, we were talking about this a little bit. Um, at that time, I was taking a class at Lighthouse Writers Workshop, which is, like, my favorite place to be if I'm not... <laughs> traveling I guess um so Lighthouse was taking a class on intro to poetry and our instructor Diane Nguyen was amazing and we were reading this great book called Olio if you haven't had a chance to read it you should read it um and I think it won a Pulitzer Prize I'm, I'm pretty sure it did um but it's a collection of um these really not abstract but really eccentric poems telling the the narratives of different slaves in the 1800s and early 1900s um, and the author used really interesting um, poetic techniques, like poems, and one of them was, I, don't, I can't remember what it's called, it, I'm not that good, um, where you can read the poem like how you normally would from the columns, and mm -hmm. then you can read it across and it's another poem, and then you can like read it backwards and it's another poem. Mm -hmm. And she challenged us to write that um, as part of one of her assignments. and. I so happened to have been at the Botanic Gardens when this, that crazy rainstorm came in last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of cool being stuck in the greenhouse. Um, and I just started writing because I couldn't go anywhere. Which I have to say, I, I read the poem and I think it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. And um, I would love for you to read it, but I feel like I would rather like post it. Because yeah. again, it's, it's at least three poems in one, mm -hmm. depending on how you read it. Read it, and, yeah. Uh, and we can yeah. link that in the comments when we're done uh, sure. with this live episode. Then we can, we'll link it so you can see both the, the picture that she drew and then read her poem. Cool. So, Absolutely. Yeah, because that was where I believe where we first met. Yeah. Because I, I knew I yeah. read the poem and I, I had to walk, because that was kind of the rumor around the office where, where everyone was like, it's not just, you know, up and down a poem, <laughs> or people would be That's reading cool, it. Yeah. Right. And some people just, when you read, just because of how the stance is where you read, down, down, and people would be like, no, 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 I read it across. Uh -huh. And so it became We're kind of, this, it was like a Rubik's Cube throughout the, the office. And, yep. was like, and so it's almost a different story depending on how yeah. you start. If right. you start up in you know, vertical, horizontal, or, mm -hmm. or 
whatever. But yeah, yeah. it was kind. Of, it was a cool challenge, and I yeah. thought I was like, oh, I like this one. It worked. <laughs> Will you tell us a little bit about the Lighthouse Workshop? Sure. Yeah. Um, so Lighthouse Writers Workshop is a nonprofit writing organization. Um, we're actually the biggest in the Rocky Mountain region. Oh. Um, in fact, I don't think there's anything similar in the United States. Um, but we offer workshops, and I say we because I sit on the board. <laughs> um, we offer workshops, we offer author events, um, reading events. Uh, we've had quite a few, I think, New York Times bestsellers come in and just talk about the books that they're, um, you know, they've recently written. Um, we do a lot of outreach, so the programs are really cool. Like my one of my favorites is well, writing in color. So um, that's the kind of lighthouse's efforts to highlight um, writers of color and get them published okay. uh, more mainstream. Um, we have a queer collectives writing group as well, um, and also Hard Times is one of my favorites. So Hard Times actually is in uh, a collaboration with the Denver Public Library, um, and we have instructors that go out and work with the homeless population um, to get them into writing, and then they publish them at the end of the year wow, in an that's anthology. Fantastic. Yeah, and so we have like that's just one of many. We I think we we have a, a program with prisoners as well, and then one for women. Um, and so we do a lot of stuff, and then that's mm -hmm. in addition to the youth programs that we have. Um, in fact, we have one author, um, uh, Kali Fajardo Einstein. Um, she started at Lighthouse as I believe as a youth student and went through our programs for years and now she's up for a national book award wow, um, so uh, yeah if you have a chance sabrina and karina is her book and we we're mm -hmm. really really proud of her um and so i think i think who's the guy from reading rainbow oh, oh um, i'm totally forgetting his name he's hosting the national book awards um i would start singing the, the song yeah <laughs> yeah, if anybody wants to comment about it, I can't believe I can't. Uh, LeVar Britton. There you go. That's who it is. Yeah, so he's hosting it this year, and I was like, oh my god, what if she gets to meet him because she won? But she's come a long way anyway. Um, but yeah, so we, um, I don't know, Lighthouse is just And it's awesome. different, so do you offer um, workshops of different lengths? Like, is it like a one-time thing, or is it over a course of several weeks or several sure. months, or all of the above? They're all of them. All okay. them. So we do one-day intensives. We have Friday 500, which is more of an open session, writing session. You can come in to our really cool house. That's what got me. I actually found it um, by accident, because it's around the corner from my office, and I was coming back from lunch, and it's this really cute mansion house off Colfax and Race. Um, and it, I was like, Lighthouse Writers Workshop, and there were the yield signs that had little poetry written in it. I don't know if you've seen the, the signs on Colfax. Um, you should check them out. They're kind of scattered. So. Down. I'll look for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what is this? And so I took a picture of it, Googled it, and the next thing I know, I'm going to Friday 500, which is um, more kind of an unstructured um, event, um, drop-in sessions where you can write in the house anywhere you want from like 4.30 to 6.30 oh, cool. um, with other writers um, and then they do like a mini craft talk if you want to join or you can continue to write um, so we have that, we have the writing and color mixer which is kind of similar but they'll toss it up a little bit, they'll have all the writers kind of come together um, for like a, a, kind of like a happy hour and then they do a panel talks or guided discussion or, or you know, workshop um, I'm taking a draft a short story right now, which is a four week intensive with one of our awesome instructors, John Cotter. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is kind of more of an advanced workshop where, you know, to help you get a short story done. Mm -hmm. and what length constitutes a short story? That is a really good class. question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because they're, I, I think the max, which is usually how writers have to be like, you know, corralled is like, don't write more than, I've been told 7,500, because if you do 7,500 plus, then you're in the novella range. Right. Okay. Um, most short stories are going to be anywhere between like 2,000 to maybe 3,500, max 5,000. What's your favorite? At a novella, just get to a novel. Yeah, right. You know, like, <laughs> novels just are try a novel. Is you know, it's still be a short funny. novel. Like, the novella is like, I don't know. <laughs> Novellas are for quitters. That's no, I'm oh yeah, well, when you get there, just let me know. Right, right, right. Um, I'm actually doing their book project, so I cool. started that on top of lawyering. <laughs> but it's like a mini MFA program for two years, and it, they help Lighthouse to, um, instructors. And we'll do like weekend intensives, one on one. You're kind of getting signed with the group. I'm actually in there with another attorney. Hi, Sumi. If you're <laughs> Sumi, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, so we're in it together. Um, but um, I'm working on a short story collection. Okay. Um, it's sci-fi South Asian, kind oh, of wow. like nice. black mirror with South Asian protagonists. 
Um, and so we have to get our manuscript done within the first year, um, and you'll have an agent read it. Um, and so it's really cool. Um, Lighthouse does a lot of I stuff. I can't yeah. wait to get involved. Yeah, I, I know. really so excited. excited. Yeah. And it's not just fiction. I get that a lot. So there's a lot of creative um, nonfiction writing, mm -hmm. um, memoirs, um, a lot to choose from. And mm -hmm. if you can dabble in something you've never done before, yeah. which for me was poetry, I'd never write. Right. Yeah. And so if you're an attorney or a lawyer or someone in the legal community and this is piquing your interest, again, we're talking, you said Lighthouse? Lighthouse Writers Workshop, yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. And we'll put a link to that as well. Yeah, yeah, we'll be probably linking a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, it's totally. It's awesome. So, another thing that you've done, because I feel like we should just like pull up and keep reading through your fantastic <laughs> resume. Um, about or your awesome personal website. Yeah, I okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Oh, plugs. I have a whole bunch of short stories on there. You do, well, yeah. The reason why I, those are up there is because I do, um, one of the other board members, Brooke um, Dilling, she's one of my favorite people, her and I have committed to doing every single short story contest, basically, out of oh this gosh. one organization. So we've done flash fiction, I just wrote one, my first screenplay, and you have like 48 hours to do it. Whoa, it's, so it's like shotgun for you just yes, have to do it. Yes, you just have Whoa. to do it. So, so you have some sort of like a magic machine or spell that gives you more hours in each day. I know. Is that <laughs> yours? <laughs> you would be surprised, I take weekends off. I had to hire a career coach to get me there. Um, but I am very, very, unless there is a absolute emergency, in which case I still tell my clients to call the cops because the courts <laughs> are closed, you know? Um, I have an absolute emergency. I do carve out Saturdays and Sundays for myself. So usually those short stories end up happening on the weekends. Which I can verify because I had a, a circus show for Z. Yes. And I ended up, so I was performing circus. Uh, which is awesome, night. by the way. Yeah, thanks. It was really cool. And I had to show. Um, so before my character, I'm at the very end, so my character is walking around amongst the audience. Uh -huh. And lo and behold, I bump into Maha. I was like, Toby? It's just like, what are you doing here? I couldn't necessarily be like, oh, I'm performing, because it's sort of a surprise. I'm sure. like, hidden, and then I come at the end. So it was just so funny. I was I like, Maha, really see that. what are you doing here? And she's like, I am finally having like my weekend. So I was yeah. like, so cool. This is my you work life balance. Yeah, yeah. The other yeah, thing is, I, I grew up here. And yeah. so it's hard to just, I mean, I don't, and I'm not trying to actively do that. I don't just have legal circles, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like all of your high school friends and then all of the other friends that you have. I have a Yelp crew <laughs> from like back in the day. So there's a Yelp Denver used to be very, very there's active. A story right there. Yelp yeah, crew. right. It was, yeah, it was, Yelp, was crew. Yelp crew. Yeah. <laughs> And then there was Cooler back in 2008, which seems really old now, but um, yeah, so we ha I have friends kind of stemming from that, and then, I don't know, the legal community, and so um, it's it's hard, I mean, there's always something going on, Yeah. you know, um, and then Denver, I guess, I kind of, I, I don't know, I, I, could, I dub myself like this brown Siri, <laughs> yeah. because if everybody wants to know what's going on in Denver, they'll come to me, they're like, what do I do for the best food, and I'm like, well... <laughs> Actually, three restaurants opened up this week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to try this for brunch. Do you want to join me? And they're yeah. like, yep, so you're a brown series. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Work life balance again. <laughs> I try. Yeah, I'm really into, like, Denver's food scene is amazing. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And it's yeah. only getting just more and more and different things. And it blew my mind. I think it was last year or two years ago. There's like a Native American restaurant that opened up. Amongst yeah. So many other things that I find to be just absolutely fantastic oh totally yeah do you have a favorite restaurant i love this is a shameless plug because <laughs> i love them there was a hickenlooper sighting there last weekend too oh. i was like is that him like i, I my friend's like she was visiting from indianapolis mm -hmm. and she goes yeah so hickenlooper hickenlooper was there he's here he's here because she could see him at the door and i was like hickenlooper was in Indian indianapolis what was he doing there she's like no no he's here <laughs> yeah, just turn around and then just like he just walks by, um, but it was at Beast and Bottle. Oh, so okay, Beast sure. and Bottle is my favorite. Oh, I live um, right around the corner from there. You should tell you about that. Their brunch is the best. Yeah, I was just about to say their brunch is. I so love them, and I was just there yesterday. No, not yesterday. Day before yesterday for um, brunch. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's delicious. <laughs> that's probably I don't know I could list off a couple, but that's my favorite. And have you been to Fa House in Alameda? I have not. You should check that out. Uh, They're actually right pretty up. good for Central Denver pho. Yeah. Oh, I love pho. There's check it out. Tell me what you think of the broth. Okay. That's, that's hashtag booty. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, we'll like exchange notes later. <laughs> you can post those in the comments too. Who knows? Yeah. Charles, you can join us. 
Um, so um, something that I, I brought up before, the camera started rolling, that I think would be, I'm personally like just fascinated by it and I would love to get your take, is that you talk about how so many of your clients come to you and they are intimidated and confused by the legal system. Sure. And um, I am new to the Bar Association. I'm also brand new to the well, legal welcome. community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also find the legal process to mm -hmm. be very intimidating and confusing. And I was wondering if you had any ideas on how to help alleviate that. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot going on um, and we just need more hands on deck for it. Um, for example, I know that through the Supreme Court there is an Access to Justice Committee and Access to Justice is a big push to try to, uh, you know, including stuff like unbundled services and pro se uh, help, self-help clinics um, to make um, lawyers more available and legal resources more available to the layperson or just, you know, everyday Coloradans, not that lawyers are any yeah. <laughs> different. Because um, lawyers who are in different practice areas need help when they, you know, sure. getting into other areas. Um, so, in my for at my firm, um, we like I offer unbundled services, which I've noticed that it's slowly kind of coming into the mainstream. It's yeah. been around for quite a while, but for some reason, attorneys are really hesitant mm -hmm. to get into it. But unbundled services basically you can hire me as a consultant and because you can't afford the retainer you'd say hey maha can i just come in for an hour and pick your brain and then the attorney can help you kind of organize yourself um, in some cases the attorney can come um, on a limited basis uh, with you to court um, in fact i just found this out and i'm sorry i know melina is probably maybe watching melina hernandez at uh, denver county she has this awesome program that she put together she's a family court facilitator and a magistrate in denver county um, called firefighters and so you can have volunteer lawyers that come in and they'll just help put out fires if it's going completely sideways with pro se parties. Ah. Oh, so they're just, they're just they jump watching in. Yeah. and like let you do your thing, but then if it really Yeah, goes the down, judge like, is like, minute, this really is not, you know, they need some help or they need someone to just pull them aside and tell them like, this is, that. yeah. Right. So, I need one of those for my life. Yeah, right. Like, right. Just to right. follow right. behind right. me. Right. Like, no, 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 wait a minute, like Charles, Shelby, don't do that. Would you again. love that? Yeah. That is a poor life decision. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have never had it. Denver County also, so all the counties also have pro se um, self help resource centers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also, along with quite a few attorneys actually for family law and probate, um, do sliding scale or they'll do low bono. Mm -hmm. um, some do pro bono, I do that on a limited basis. I offer sliding scale services, so um, my hourly rate is actually dependent on your how much you're making and your monthly expenses. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to push for more attorneys to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to undermine all of the incredible work that you know, the Supreme Court is doing, individual attorneys are doing um, to make that happen. Um, and so that's definitely something that's been on the radar for a while and I know that they're doing what they can to keep, mm -hmm. keep moving it forward. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a really astute observation. And I know November 21st, the CBACLE is doing a federal court like pro se yep. clinic in mm -hmm. order to help so it's interesting, obviously you're super well tapped in, like you know the pulse of the legal community, but hopefully it seems that other people are starting to, to sure. follow your lead as well, and amongst others, and not only be more educated, but be more involved in that regard. And I hope, this is my thing I think for attorneys too, is to say that you can do all of this, you can take the pro se cases, you can work with nonprofits, you can do unbundled services and do sign scale, and still have a pretty decent life, mm -hmm. you know? Like I can still go travel to like, three or four countries a year. Um, I know that's that's a limitation depending on if you have a family and other you know things going on in your life, but you can do those things mm -hmm. and still enjoy life and not feel like you're not earning enough or you're not, you know, you don't have the means to do what you need to do in life. So mm -hmm. um, I, I hope that that gets out, um, that you can do those things like through my firm and through my practice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and Denver County just had a pro se day too. Yeah. Um, and it's just so heartwarming to see all those attorneys yeah. there and the judges. and. We yeah. have uh, like pro bono week and people just talk yep. about different things that they've done. It's always it's always wonderful. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always the stigma of, of lawyers or the legal community or again of it just being intimidating and being able with, you know, case by case or civil sure. conversation by conversation to help, you know, debunk that. And it's, it's, I mean, just sitting down with some people, if they can only afford, you know, my lowest rate for an hour, I mean, it's so helpful to them because they don't feel as, they feel more empowered, mm -hmm. you know, and Unbundled is a really great way to help people be able to do that. Mm -hmm.
Um, and then some, you know, even with the unbundleable sliding scale to be able to step in in a fight that, you know, the other side has more money or whatever it is and, and take that on and make sure that it's equal footing, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reward in that too, I think, sure. to be able to help others with your long I've definitely noticed, again, in the short time I've been here, more and more opportunities to, to volunteer mm -hmm. are coming up to make it easier to volunteer. Yeah. You know? Yeah, which shameless plug to MVL and our Access to Justice, which are two different sections, one with CBA if you're oh, like, MVL is looking awesome. to get, yeah, looking yeah. To get more and more and more involved, um, two really, really special programs. Well, and using the whole unbundling model mm -hmm. as a way to open up volunteer opportunities sure you know. and you just I think it's that we need a little bit more education as to how that works because attorneys just don't want to get involved and say oh my god now I'm on the whole case but you know there's a process you know limited entry of appearance and you're mm -hmm. telling the judge of just doing this one thing um, and that really helps and then the more you do it you get comfortable with it and I I have seen an incredible support from the judiciary um, on that. So they recognize, okay, the fact that you're just even on this case is helping us out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, we just need more people to try it out. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So I know you said you've been doing this for five years. Like yeah, I just passed. Being passed. Yeah, this past Sunday. Yeah. Yay. So <laughs> I know now that you're kind of looking back a little bit and November 4th, so I guess Monday, we just accepted new Colorado attorney. Yeah. So what's something that you would tell either a new attorney or Maha five years ago? What's, what's your little oh like, hey, by the way, advice or? Um, well, first off, congratulations to everybody who just joined the bar, welcome. Um, this is an amazing community. I think we're really, really lucky to have a bar here in Colorado and just the community that we do. So, um, and you feel free to reach out to me if you ever need help. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if I can help in your particular field, but um, that's what we're here for, I think, is all attorneys, especially if you've been in the field for a little bit, to like reach out to the, the more, you know, less experienced ones that might need some help. Um, the one thing, if you're a civil litigator or practitioner, <laughs> I wish that someone had told me to read Rule 121. <laughs> um, read it. Just it's so Colorado Rules and Civil Procedure had they have specific rules for service and filing and motions and that kind of stuff, and that just governs everything under the, the umbrella of civil law. So that's family, probate, just general civil. And when I got into the practice, I was like what is conferral, you know, because I've cured to the grapevine, but it wasn't part of any of our law school classes. It really wasn't. And there is an entire section of, of the Colorado Rules of Civil Procedure called um, just Rule 121, but it's like 21 subsections of things that you need to do prior to filing or, you know, other, when certain conditions, when you can file for like a motion for reconsideration, you can't just do it. Right. So you always have to confer on motions, and you have that means conferral means you have to reach and out they to didn't the other. Teach you that oh, in no. law school? No, it's a fine print. What were they yeah. teaching you there? I don't know. know. It seems like the basic like rule book here. Yeah, okay. so read Rule One Twenty One. Right. Um, if you're not a civil litigator or practitioner, I would read it anyway because there's some great advice <laughs> in there. And as as a as I think a standard practice, professional practice, some of these the rule just makes a hundred percent sense. You know, mm -hmm. conferral. So give the other party notice. Try to work it out. You know, don't just file a motion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a whole bunch in there, but I would not get too much into it. Um, and then five years ago, gosh, I will say I did not pass the bar the first time. Interesting. Um, and so actually, um, that was kind of traumatic, but I, I was like, you know, we're just going to, what are we going to do? You mm -hmm. know, at that point, let's just take a week off to <laughs> recover mm -hmm. and just try it again. And what did I, you know, this is one of those times where you really have to look back at what did I do that I should, I, what, I, what I could have done that I didn't do. Right. Um, professor, I don't know if Professor Scott Jones is still at DU, he was such a godsend, um, mm -hmm. where he said, okay, take some time off, we're going to get the results back from the February bar, and then we're going to sit down, and I'm going to do this with you until you realize, like, you understand it. Um, and, and I would have not been able to pass the second time without him. Um, but I actually wrote this little guidebook on mm -hmm. how to survive not passing the bar the first time, and I, like, illustrated it. <laughs> and so Professor Johns, I think, still gives it out, because I, I actually had a clerk um, in one of my cases um, come up to me after the case, and she says, I didn't pass the first time I got your guidebook. <laughs> 
I would love to see that. Yeah, yeah I know. So I get that request from time to time. Not as so much now, I think, because I've been out of um, school for a lot longer. But um, I'll take people out to happy hour or coffee if they didn't pass and just mm-hmm. let them know, look, you can still do amazing things. And nobody cares after a year or two. Then yeah. it really matters. All that matters is what you're doing in the bar. So um, I would just say... Can you take it as many times as you yeah. need to? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, there you go. I actually met so many cool people at the Office of Attorney Regulation Council, including um, the former um, counsel, Jim Coyle, um, Chief Chief Regulation Council. Um, he kind of took me under his wing as a mentor, and he said, you'll get through this, you just have to do it. And mm-hmm. it was so encouraging, and that was really the way that I, um, I don't know, that was the way I really was introduced to the bar was before I even got licensed. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the bar exam sounds like so much fun. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. just so Jumping at the bed to do it myself. Although yeah. sometimes I have these random memories about, about it. Memories are PTSD. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I know, right? Right. So I'm like, I remember that from corporate law, but it's, oh. Nice. <laughs> Now you have to get your CLEs done. I do sit on the CLE committee, so you should always get your CLEs done. <laughs> See, yeah. Lighthouse CLE committees. How many, can we just go through any other? And Cobalt as well. Yes. Fun shout out to Cobalt. Yes. The Colorado Bar, Bar Association Leadership Training Program is amazing. That's fair yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah. something. Any, any other? No, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually it had really to update. Oh, well, thank you. I had to um, update my resume yesterday. Not because I'm leaving my firm. It's just um, another committee that I wanted to apply for. Um, and I'm like, holy wow, that's a lot of stuff that I've yeah. done. Um, Board of Governors for CBA mm-hmm. as a DBA liaison. Um, oh, and then I do sit on the Board of um, Directors for the Humanist Legal Society. That's a branch of the American Humanist Association. Um, so, you know, we do stuff there too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Busy. So in other words, you've got plenty of open time in your calendar to take yeah. on. And if you have any projects that you need <laughs> yeah. uh, help with, uh, any out. trips I'll that you need out. planning yeah. or Are anything you need to do, just talk. Just, you know, yeah, that fun to do. Because <laughs> again, she has some machine I, or a spell that gives yeah. her extra hours. Imagine she actually like plugs herself in at right. night. Um, <laughs> I always try to, and then I also try to get into the gym. That is self care that you should absolutely try to do. So I go to Orange Theory like three or four times a week, which I love my OTF crew if they're watching. I don't know why they would, but there you go. Hi, Coach Gary and Allison. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. And then I took art classes yesterday. Mm-hmm. That was fun. Art garage. Um, that was after hours. So that was late. Yeah. I just I don't like the fact that it's, it's getting dark, dark at right you know, two o'clock. I know, um, but I wanted to actually do improve some of my skills. I'm, I just suck at light and shadow. Like mm-hmm. that's something I could never do since um, high school. And so I hired a private instructor. We sat there, and he it really felt like I was back in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good or bad? It's good. It's good. But this time yeah. I'm actually paying attention. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hatching and cross hatching always. He taught some of that too. Yeah. 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 So I took, a, um, I took a basic drawing class in uh, when I was in college, and oh my gosh, I am not, art is not well, pretty good at writing. Or I just need more practice, I suppose. It, it 10, does 10,000 hours, I believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for? For to be like, what is it, you just put your 10,000 hours in for it to be, I don't know. Oh, I haven't heard this. We'll just go. Oh, to be like, become like, proficient or advanced yeah, in the skill yeah, for yeah. anything. Yeah, for 10, anything. 10,000 hours. Or just, you know, we'll just default to Bob Ross, where it's like everything's a happy accident. Right. That line, that's a happy accident. No, that's not. No, what was his background? I don't know. I have to Wikipedia Bob Ross. Bob know. Ross, his background was, um, I don't know, some sort of an angel surprise. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. It was like a nurse. Absolute godsend. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Now I'm going to do, I do that too, where I just have to distract myself. So I go down those Wikipedia rabbit holes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I feel like we're wrapping up yeah. a little bit. Um, is there, amongst all the things that you're doing, you're in between, is there anything that you'd like to add or a fun fact about you or something up and coming that you're excited about? Just something to kind of leave our adoring fans of Maha. Um, yeah, when I'm not in between client calls or hanging out with awesome people at the CBA, <laughs> I'm like trying to nail down the specifics of my next trip, which I'm doing. Oh. I'm going to... Um, 
what is it, Thailand for Christmas with some of my my Canadian crew. <laughs> I do have a Canadian crew um, from Vancouver and then Cambodia and Vietnam. Oh, and so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do on New Year's. I do a lot of solo traveling. Um, and so, which gets me into the bigger point, I think, and Shelby, you and I were talking about this, is I really, really encourage attorneys to take some time, whether it's this weekend or soon, and just come up with a list of things that you've always wanted to do in your life. You know, like, I wanted to go here, and I wanted to do this, or whatever, and see how much of that is really out there for you to be able to do. Um, and I do that. I have my client, you know, work to-do list every week. And then post-its for every day. Um, and then I have this personal to-do list. You know, it's like, I want to get these things done. I want to learn light and shadow. So I don't have to do it all at once, but I'll try to make that happen. So if there's one thing, like one place you wanted to go, honestly, just book it. <laughs> Pull out your credit card and go to United. Okay, that is not a plug for United. But, <laughs> uh, whatever, Star Alliance or, you know, Sky Team, whatever your thing is. Um, and just go. And it doesn't have to be something crazy like Vietnam. It could be, I've never been to this city and I've never been to New Orleans, you know? I was going to say, should go to, I'll be in New Orleans for uh Oh my gosh, you're going to have to tell me. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I need to find a boat and how long to be <laughs> Vietnam. I don't know how that's going to work yeah, out. Right. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And that's part of the fun. So find create that personal list and start checking it off. That's all I want to say. If there's one place that I can suggest in Bangkok is um, the Temple of the Golden Mount. Okay. So obviously Bangkok oh, totally is, is huge. It's filled with all sorts of things that you should see. But the Temple of the Golden Mount, it's just a very peaceful. Like you climb oh, up awesome. these like yeah. hundreds of stairs to get to the top. And um, they sell ice cream when you get, when you get to the top. That's amazing. Um, get to the top. I mean, there's some really delicious yeah. as well, but there's what also some cream. beverages and some ice cream. Um, but yeah, check oh, cool. that out yeah, and um, take your time walking up, and there's all sorts of things to see and views of the city. I know we have to wrap up, but um, what I use is my travel guide. This kind of reminded me of what you, um, it's called Atlas Obscura. You know, oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. It's my go-to travel guide, and they have off-beaten path like recommendations in Mexico City and Vietnam, and I found some really cool places that there were like little to no tourists, um, and it was such an incredible experience. Like um, Leon Trotsky's house in oh, cool. Mexico City. It's literally around the corner from Frida Kahlo's house because well, they, they were totally were having an affair. Wow. Um, but nobody goes there because they don't know it's there, and he was assassinated there, and everything's been preserved in the house. Oh wow! Um, and it's funny because like the 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 communist of Mexico City or whatever run it, um, and so they they have like a cash only thing, and if you try to use, this is the funny part about this if you try to use your credit card to purchase a ticket, then they make you buy extra from the store. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna get like their the cash irony, no matter what. Just, right? So it's like, yeah, but the stuff like that, Atlas Obscura is really great for that. Cool. Too, so. That's great. Cool. Well, again, thank you so so thank much. You of course, so thank much. you so much. It's been fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, your life is so boring. You do nothing. But yeah, I know. I'm gonna go um, make their no, this has been inspiring. Really, well, I'm excited to, to check out some of the stuff that you recommended. Yeah, and we'll definitely add a bunch of the links in the comments too. If you have any further questions, you can always reach out to Maha. Yes, um, please do. Otherwise, thank you for tuning yeah, in. Yeah, thank I'm you. Turn us down off, and uh, yeah, we'll see you later. <laughs>